The following program will make you want to grow things and experience new and wonderful dreams about your plants, garden, and garden design. Listener participation is always strongly advised. Good evening and welcome to Down the Garden Path with your hosts, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing, right here on Reality Radio 101. To get on board, send us an email right now. Our email address is instudio101 at gmail.com. And now, right to your hosts of Down the Garden Path, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing. Thank you and welcome everyone to this episode of Down the Garden Path. We're here each week to discuss down-to-earth tips and advice for your plants, gardens, and landscapes. As landscape designers and gardeners, we think it is important and possible to have great gardens that are low maintenance and we want to help you make it happen. I am Joanne Shaw, landscape designer and owner of Down to Earth Landscape Design for the past 11 years. It is currently a design-only business here east of the GTA in Ontario, Canada. And with me is my co-host, Matthew Dressing. Welcome, Matthew. Good evening, Joanne. Good evening, everyone. I am Matthew Dressing, horticulturist and landscape designer and owner of Natural Affinity Designs. Natural Affinity is a landscape design and garden maintenance firm servicing Toronto and the eastern GTA. Joanne and I enjoy doing Down the Garden Path each week, bringing you interesting, relevant, and helpful topics to help you achieve a great garden. We learn right along with you from each other, from our research, and from the great guests that join us here on the show. As always, we welcome your questions via social media and emails. That's right. And we want to thank you once again, always, for joining us here on Down the Garden Path. You can also check out past shows of Down the Garden Path on your favorite podcast app because we release the show a little later in the week as a podcast. And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe so you'll be notified of new content. And please like, share and leave us a comment. That's right. That's right. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Yeah, so October is here. Fall is in the air, Matthew. Uh, can you believe it? It's well underway. Uh, there's one thing that we've all been kind of waiting for to do. Mm -hmm. We've all got, we've been out there shopping and vying. Uh, and it's planting our fall bulbs. That's right. Right. But for the most part, I think we think of them only as like our early spring color when mm -hmm. really they're really actually so much more. Mm -hmm. That's true. So we're excited tonight. We're joined by Peggy Ann Montgomery from flowerbulbs.com to discuss the importance of spring bulbs as a source of pollen and nectar to the myriad of beneficial insects that are going to wake up uh, every, you know, every spring that we wake up that is in our garden. That's right. So don't forget, um, we always have our design dilemma show. So write in any of your questions. If you have a design dilemma with your bulbs, uh, Peggy Ann is going to give us lots of great tips and tricks, I'm sure. Don't forget, if you want to join the conversation, um, you we'd love to hear from you. As always, you can write us here uh, in studio at 101 uh in studio 101 at gmail.com uh, or reach us anytime. Joanne at down the number two earth.ca and Matthew at natural affinity designs.ca. Excellent, excellent. And before we, uh, Peggy joins us, I'll read just a little bit more, a little bit of her bio. So Peggy Ann is an account executive at the Garden Media Group. She has been a horticulturalist for over 30 years with a background in native plant research, public relations, and sales with a large wholesale nursery. 
She studied horticulture in the Netherlands, where she raised a family and owned a sustainable landscape design business. Yay! <laughs> she has written numerous trade and popular publications over the years, such as Better Homes and Gardens, Fine Gardening, PHS's Grow Magazine, and Organic Gardening, and appeared on several television shows about gardening. Flowerbulbs.com represents a consortium of flower bulb growers in the Netherlands. They don't sell any product. Instead, they've created a website designed to educate and inspire consumers. Welcome to the show, Peggy Ann. Hi, thank you so much for having me. You're, yes, I'm really excited about this. It's yeah. Fun to talk about something you love. That's right. It's so much fun to talk about stuff that we loved, isn't it? It is. So as Matt was saying, I mean, uh, we we think everybody is this time of year in the, you know North America, most of North America, are getting ready to plant their spring bulbs, and people are coming at it usually from the standpoint of oh, I just want spring color. Uh huh. But bulbs are more than that, aren't they? You know, they uh, they really are more than that, and of course they are spring color, and they're some of the first things to bloom, and I think that. That makes them the most precious. You know, we've waited all snowy winter, and to see those first flowers bloom is very exciting. But it's not just exciting for us. It's really exciting for um, pollinators early in the season. Um, Honeybees and queen bees and solitary bees emerge fairly early, and they really need a food source. They do, don't they? Um, Yeah. And and I, I know we often say we're, I know there's been a big uh, movement to you know not cut the or kill the dandelions right because that's a re- yep. another early food source, uh, and you know the fruit trees of course that are blooming but the really really early ones bulbs kind of win that don't they? Yeah, they really do. In fact, even beekeepers say that they would additionally feed their bees until the dandelions start to bloom. So if you think of like you know some of the earliest. Um, Crocuses, snowdrops, um, aranthus, um, winter buttercup. You know, they start flowering here in the mid-Atlantic in February. Ooh. And um, it's a really important time. Honeybees don't actually hibernate, <clears throat> but they, um, you know, they've been pretty much in their hive all winter, and they've used up all of their stores. They're very, it's the lowest point of the year for them, so they really need to get some nectar and pollen to keep going. Um it's also the time that the queen bees come out and begin to lay their eggs, and they have to have pollen and nectar, um, you know, in order to feed them. Um, and so it's very, you know, important to their nesting. And the same with solitary bees like bumblebees. We'll see those out really early. And they don't have too much energy when they emerge, and they really need um, to find some somewhere to forage really close to where they're, where they're nesting. Okay. So do you have um, your top, let's say, top five or top ten favorites that you recommend that we oh, consider? That's impossible. I'd have a top million. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you some of my favorites. Okay. Um, you know, the other thing about bulbs is, too, is that they, um, you know, some start flowering as early as February, and some don't start false flowering until June. Ooh. So you can really extend the season of color in your yard by planting different bulbs that flower at different times of the year. Excuse me. So early, of course, are the snowdrops and crocus and winter buttercup, um, glory of the snow, Siberian squill, and um, species tulips. Um, Daffodils also, there's some early ones and also mid-bloomers. I love anemones. I can't even say it right. (laughs) And... um, this year, flowerbulb.com has declared it the year of the grape hyacinth muscari, oh. which is one of my very favorite bulbs because they flower for such a long time. Um, checkered lilies, of course, are wonderful in our native Camassia. And then, you know, later in the year, of course, there's beautiful alliums, um, irises, um, and even later than that, crocosmia, you know, more alliums, agapanthus, foxtail lilies, the list goes on and on. Mm-hmm. But those are some that pollinators really uh, are attracted by. And I, you know, we were talking about um, basic, Matthew and I were saying, you know, the, or you, all three of us before the show, right? How, the, you know, we, because we're in the industry, we kind of know things and, and we're surprised that it, some people don't. Um, but I have to mm-hmm. say, I don't think I realized that there really was that much 
I guess the way t- bulbs that flower, and the, I didn't realize that there was as much pollen in them as compared to other flowers. Yeah, um, crocus is a really good example. I've seen a lot of pictures of bee butts um, on <laughs> Facebook when they're driving into the crocus flowers, and I've never really seen this, but I've read it that um, bumblebees will get inside crocus because the flowers close up at night and sleep inside there in that little cocoon. Isn't that cute? Oh, my goodness. That is so cute. That is cute. Yeah. I know. I love it. And if you really start to pay attention, if you look around in your yard, um, my husband's a horticulturist, too, so we've got thousands and thousands of bulbs. Um, but if you look around and start to pay attention, you'll see how many pollinators are really interested in them. Okay. Well, that's... Um, yeah, that's good. I tend to be, I mean, I don't, do you plant a lot of bulbs? Cause Matthew's in an apartment, so you don't really plant a lot of bulbs. Uh-huh. I, I don't really know. No. no. And, uh, and I've never have like the, ch- the squirrels always kind of do me in. So I've never really been a huge tulip fan, but I haven't considered myself the other, I mean, a big allium fan. So I do plant a lot of alliums, but they are a bit later in the season. Right. So now yep, I'm excited. Now, are. yeah, now I'm thinking, okay, I think I really need to go out and get some of the early ones. Well, yeah, and, you know, the other thing, too, is a lot of people in this country have deer pressure. And so there are still quite a few bulbs that um, that deer don't really care for. Mm. Um, tulips is not one of them. Right. Um, but snowdrops and crocus, especially the really early ones, the Thomasinianus, um, the Tommies, uh, deer don't seem to like. They don't like daffodils. And one trick some people use is to mix daffodils in with their tulips. So, ah. um you know, rodents and deer smell those daffodils and leave them alone. Right. Um, anemones and, of course, muscaria, grape hyacinths and checkered lily um, are all, um, you know, not very attractive to deer. And um, same with um, the wood hyacinth. Okay. So, you know, there's still quite a few things you can plant. And it doesn't get much earlier than uh, snowdrops and crocus. Right. So those are good choices. Um, snow. Now, when we're planting those, so let's just say snow gro- snowdrops and crocus, um, you probably want to plant for the bees. How, like, what's our minimum that you want? You know, like they come come in a package of five, let's say. But is that enough? Should people be buying three packages? Well, I would say that five is better than nothing. But <laughs> if you can, um, try to plant in large groups. Okay. If you plant in large groups like that, it makes it easier uh, for pollinators to find the flowers. Mm. Um, and so, you know, if it's, you know, if you can't afford to do it all in one year, what you could do is plant 25 snowdrops this year and 25 next year and keep expanding the area. Okay. That's one way to do it. But planting in large swaths like they do in the Netherlands is really the best way for pollinators to be able to find them. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, and we have a question here from John. Uh, John is saying hi again, and he's asking us to please review which end is up for planting. <laughs> so I guess it <laughs> depends great. on the bulb, but uh, it does. And we're talking very generally and seeing bulbs, but there's corms and other things. So yeah, absolutely, pointy end goes up. But there are some things like anemones, for example, that um, look like a shriveled up, you know, milk dud or something yeah. and that you can't see what side is up. And so don't worry about that. Um, just go ahead and plant it and the, the plant will write itself. It'll grow up. That's right. And even we talked about that because we just did a show on garlic, too. And we said uh, that, you know, even if you ac- you can't tell which is the pointy end, John, the you know, go ahead and plant it. And the plant knows, the you know, knows where to go to the light. So the plant will adjust. Right, exactly. If you accidentally exactly. plant it upside down. The plant will, you're not going to not get a flower. The plant uh, might take up, you know, a couple days longer. But, uh, right. yeah, so not to worry. There's no wrong, you not know. Not to worry. Excellent. And then, you know, a good general rule of thumb is to plant a bulb about two or three times as deep as it's high. Oh. You know, so if you have a two-inch bulb, you're going to want to plant it, you know, four, you know, four to six inches deep. Okay. Yeah. That's very cool. I've also heard, uh, I mean, maybe you have some experience again because I'm in a condo. Um, <laughs> it is safe to plant them a couple, like like a four times as deep. If we've got like a lot of chipmunks and squirrels that maybe dig them up, they will only dig so far down and and then forget about them. Is have you found that to be true? Um, 
you know, I, well, they can they can be very tenacious. So yeah. I hate to say and make any general remarks about that, but um, I think it is better. I think it's a little safer if they're deeper. Although I have known squirrels to dig up um, newly planted any kind of plant. Yeah. Um, yeah, they seem to gravitate toward freshly moved soil. Mm-hmm. Um, but some people plant them like they'll take some chicken wire and put the bulbs like make that little container out of that. Put the bulbs in there. And then plant that whole thing, and that helps to keep some of the rodents out. Yeah. Yeah, and I liked your idea of planting it, mixing the tulips, especially if it's tulips, mixing the tulips and daffodils or tulips mm-hmm. and alliums because uh, squirrels, yep. um, you know, and, and deer as well, but I think I personally have deal more with squirrels, don't like daffodils and don't like alliums. Although I think right. the same goes for the for the deer. So all of our listeners, uh, you know, that can be a little secret is is you can create a nice swath, um, like Peggy Ann was suggesting, but by mixing the bulbs and you'll you know they may bloom at different times, which is also nice. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and there's even a way they call lasagna planting, which is um, there's also kinds of information about it on our website at flowerbulbs.com. But it's planting bulbs in a pot, and so like the latest flowering on the bottom, so it, like it might be tulips, and then the next layer up would be daffodils, and the next layer up could be um, glory of the snow, and the next layer up could be crocuses or snowdrops. And so these flowers just keep blooming. As one fades, the next one comes up and takes its place. And um, for a container, you know, you can get a really long season of interest. Wow, yes. Now, how- Yeah, they call it lasagna planting. I think that's yeah, that is a great idea. What size pot do you recommend? Oh, I think a good size one. Yes, yes, I would think so too. Because you, you know, want at least, um, yeah, you'd want a good layer of each one. Right. Yeah, I would say a good size pot. And you know, of course, clay pots are wonderful, but they also have some other lighter duty ones now that are easier for people to carry around, and that would be perfectly acceptable. Mm-hmm. And could those stay outside all winter? Yeah, no, it depends a little bit on where you're where you're located to the whole country. So, right. If I was uh, in my hometown in Minnesota, I would uh, probably put them in the garage. Ah, um, okay. You know, other places. I think here in Delaware in the Mid Atlantic, I think we could get away with leaving them outside. You know, like up on my up on the porch, close to the house. Mm, okay. Okay, so, I mean, because I'm on a condo, maybe I can't do that. And I have to give it a try. Yeah, um, I, I would have to leave it, it outside. Yeah. So maybe that'll be an experiment. Yep. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so you said a very large container. What about the depth of the container? For planting them to about six inches deep, do we want a container that's like 12 inches tall? Or would we? St- would, oh, is that no, okay I, still? taller than that. I'm thinking a couple of feet. Ooh, okay. 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 Yeah, Excellent. like your big outdoor containers that you you know, might have decorating the patio in the summertime, uh, could do some double duty. Okay. Okay. Well, that's a good idea. Very neat. Yeah. Um, and a container is a good idea, too, because if you have it for so long in the container, you could always, you know, uh, do it like an insert almost, too. You could put it in, in the pot, and then when it's spent, take it out and yeah, uh, mm-hmm. keep, keep the bulbs or plant them or reuse them, I guess. Yeah. Maybe. Absolutely. You know, gardening is all about experimenting anyway. So yes. if you've never done that before, I would encourage listeners to, like, say, um, just try it with something small. Like, just try five in a smaller pot and see how that works. Yeah. So um, we've got another listener question. Oh, we've got a few. A few, actually. Um, Josh is writing in, hi, maybe a silly question, um, but do you need to water the bulbs once planted, or is there no need? And maybe Josh is thinking that it's kind of a, we're doing something in the fall, the soil's kind of moist already, or we're getting a lot of the fall rains. Hey, that's a great question, and there's no such thing as a silly question. <laughs> so it's a, it's a great idea. After you plant your bulbs, to water that area thoroughly um, one time with the hose and so that, you know, you're sure that the soil is, um, you know, all around the bulbs, that there aren't any air pockets. Um, and after that, you don't, won't need to water them again. Oh, okay. That's good. One nice thing is that we generally get more precipitation in fall. Mm-hmm. So that's going to do the job. And actually, the bulbs are going to uh, be kind of resting as they go through this winter dormancy. So they're not going to need a lot of water. In fact, um, one sure thing that will kill your bulbs is if they're 
in really um, wet ground. Um, okay. They don't like that. If you think about uh, in Holland, a lot of the bulb fields are in very, very sandy soil. Mm. So, you know, make sure that there's good drainage and it's not an area that stays wet. Perfect, perfect. Well, that ties in with our second yeah. question, Peggy. Go ahead. All I right. was just going to say, yeah, Julia follows on the tail of Josh. Uh, hi, love the show and your guest. Uh, when planting bulbs, do you need a good drainage area in your garden so the bulbs don't rot? And thank you for your answer. And I think yeah, you touched absolutely. to that. That's really the number one mm-hmm. most important thing. And otherwise, you know, they are not that finicky. In fact, a lot of bulbs could be planted right in your lawn mm. and come up and surprise you. We have good crocus coming up in our front lawn. And by the time it comes time for me to cut the grass, they, they have all, you know, they're finished and right. they've already, um, you know, their foliage is spent and they can just go back down. So um, that's a great way to do it. Drainage is important. Um, another f- a great place to plant early bulbs is um, under shrubs or in front of shrubs. They get sunlight because they don't have their, they don't have any foliage early in the year. And that just really brightens up that area. And by the time the leaves are coming out and your shrubs are waking up, the flower bulb foliage is going down. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. If one didn't like crocus, were there some other bulbs uh, that you might recommend to put into your lawn area? Oh, absolutely. Um, crocus are one. Snowdrops are great. Um, winter buttercup, Aranthus, um, is works really well. That's a really early, um, let's see... You know, Kynodoxa, Glory of the Snow, would probably be another good choice. Okay. I bet the Miscar would so great pie in the early in Holland, yeah. every, every small town, the park in every small town just explodes with thousands and thousands and thousands of, say, crocus. And it just looks like it snowed pastel colors. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Um, We have another question. Uh, Jazz has written in, and uh, she says, uh, Hi, Joanne and Matthew. Absolutely love the radio show. My question, I know that most people plant their spring bulbs now, but what is the latest time that we can plant them? Is November too late? Thank you. Now, of course, it depends where you are, but uh, what do you think? uh, Yeah, number one, it depends where you are. Um, I don't know. My husband keeps planting bulbs until December, but I'm not sure that's a good idea. Ideally, um, you know, September, October, November are all good times. Um, Try to do it, um, you know, four to six weeks before the ground freezes. Okay. All right. You know, to be on the very safe side, you know, and as gardeners, of course, we will all push that envelope and try to do it a little later and they'll probably be okay. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, I know we um, we did our October in the garden uh, once a month. We talk about uh, what to do in the garden the following month, and uh, we encourage people. I think to to hold off and not plant too too early their bulbs just because of right. the squirrels and the deer, you know, things that are kind of. Uh, start getting at them, the critters, to kind of delay it a right. little bit. So there tends to be, but we never know when that like a hard frost is going to come, right? So uh, so that's a right. great question, Jazz, because I think it's it's really uh, tricky. It is tricky, and you know, and it's not just the first frost. It's when um, the ground is actually frozen. So you know, obviously, you know, this is another thing. If you buy bulbs, um, it will probably say on the package, or if you buy them mail order, they'll send them to you at the correct time to plant. Ah. Um, but I, you're absolutely right about. It. I wouldn't do it before September, certainly. For sure. And we don't always know exactly when the ground is going to freeze, but we have a pretty good idea mm-hmm. um, when it's going to get pretty darn cold yeah what t- when is that for you guys up in canada uh, probably very much like minnesota i think we're pretty you know pretty uh, similar yeah. to that and we never know um but i know i've been out <laughs> with gloves on just like that you know uh, mm-hmm. the one the saturday i'll be out uh, planting bulbs in the cold and then the sunday i'll be out putting my christmas urn together in the cold right so <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> so we exactly. tend to exactly. procrastinate so, yeah. until we really have to do it and then we're like oh i've got to do both <laughs> yeah that sounds about right yeah <laughs> I think in Minnesota and the northerly climes, I think you would be great in September and most of October, too. Right, right. That's good. So we've got our bulbs. We've planted them. We know they don't want really wet soil. Um, Is there anything else we need to do, like, to prepare or protect them going through the winter? We talked, um, you mentioned the the wire cage cup 
uh, kind of idea of planting with the bulbs. Is there anything else we need to do to them to prevent uh, any rodents or animals by kind of digging them up and doing You know, anything? if you really think you're going to have some problem, if you've got some, you know, well um, thugs in your yard that are digging mm. things up, you could try to use something like um, a, a spray repellent. Okay. Okay. Um, and that could help protect them until... You know, it got good and cold, and the and the ground is frozen, and they couldn't bother him anymore. Okay. And now we would spray the bulbs, or are we going to spray the soil surface? I would spray the soil. Okay. That's what they'll yeah. smell first. Mm-hmm. Okay. So maybe it would keep those pesky squirrels from getting in there and digging them up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I have heard about, you know, just to mention back to the watering, is that I've heard a trick that, you know, squirrels, the rodents, don't tend to like their paws getting wet. So I think, and I and I think that's something, if people did, made sure they did water, you know, the them in the first time, and that that yeah. soil was a little wet, that that would kind of deter them. And, the, you know, but then the rain would come and, you know, so they wouldn't have to keep watering the bulbs. But that initial, you know, I think it's usually when they get them, right? It's it's usually at the beginning. So, mm-hmm. uh, so yeah. So I think remembering to water them, I think, is a good, you know, but not too much, like you said, in that we need the well-drained soil. Yeah. No, I think that's really good advice. I, th- I think that's great. Yeah. Absolutely. And one other thing I kind of want to mention before we get too far is sure. that. Um, you know, another thing to think about when you're choosing your bulbs is um, trying to choose ones that have a um, a single flower. Ooh, Sometimes, good. like, think about beautiful double, you know, daffodils, and they're so gorgeous. Um, because the flower form is altered, it's really hard for pollinators, bees, and other pollinators to get in um, to get the nectar, or sometimes Ooh. they're sterile. Okay. So by trying to choose something that's more like the original form, you know, just a single um, flower is best for pollinators. It, but that's having said that, um, go ahead and plant those double daffodils for <laughs> yourself because they're gorgeous. Right, yes. And I guess that would be the same with tulips, too. Yes, exactly. Okay. Okay, so that's good. So maybe to have a mix of the double, if you really like the double, um, which is kind of yeah. a you know a trend, and they they are a little bit more unique. Um, but to plant some of the single varieties for the bees. Yeah, absolutely. And you know another thing um, that these can be great for um, are cutting gardens. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're, any of your listeners have cutting gardeners or maybe some space in their vegetable garden. Um, it's really nice to be able to plant some of these um, so you can cut them and bring them in the house early in the season. You know, there's nothing like, you know, fresh-picked daffodils on the table to remind you that spring's coming. Yeah, that is a great idea, actually. I'm just thinking about our vegetable gardens. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. That is wonderful. Oh, it's worth it to get those early flowers mm-hmm. in the house, I think. Mm-hmm. So, Peggy Ann, we have uh, Mason writes in. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I live in Zone 9, uh, so we have quite the warm fall season. Should I wait until late fall slash early winter? What is the ideal temperature to plant? Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't hear where he was from. <clears throat> um, he just said Zone 9. Oh, Zone 9. Okay. Well, you're living in a beautiful, <laughs> southerly warm yeah. climate. And so you would have to buy pre-cooled bulbs. Ooh. Bulbs really need to go through a cold period, okay. a winter period. So if you want to have some, grow some bulbs, and you are living in the, you know, in the lush, warm banana belt of our country, then mm. um, you need to buy them pre-cooled, and then you you can plant them late in the fall. Okay. And the packages which should just say kind of pre-cooled for for Mason. Yeah, there will be that on there, and um, also online sources um, are another great way to look for them, and um, many of them will have a special category called pre-cooled bulbs. Pre-cooled bulbs. I've never heard of that, but because we don't need those. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. It's plenty cold in Ontario. (laughs) That's right. That's right. So, Mason, hopefully you find some of those that are pre-cooled, and you would think that, um, Peggy Ann, that the stores, you know, in those areas would would have like would they you think even store them in the fridge um you know i i don't know to tell you the truth i would think that they would have them 
okay. or be able to tell you where to get them. Okay. It's it's not as far fetched as you might think. A lot of people plant um, pre cooled bulbs. Oh, okay. It's a, in a lot of ways just like forcing, like we do with um, in the winter time with amaryllis and um, you know um, paper whites and things like that. Okay. All right. I so think, those bulbs, like I'm thinking those bulbs then won't be, you know, in, in Ontario, they're going to be asleep for a long period of time. But in those states, they're not going to be, right? That's the idea that there might they might come up like a few months after planting? Yeah, they'll flower, but they won't be able to go through another cold period. So it will be a one-year kind of thing. Oh, okay. Okay. Interesting. Oh, no, I, I was know. just going to... You've got all the sun and warmth down there, but we've, we've got cold temperatures. We can grow bulbs. <laughs> that was the trade-off. That's right. I was just going to say, um, the garden center where I work at, uh, I know our hyacinths come in pre, pre-chilled or, or oh, okay. pre-thinged. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people like to force hyacinths and bring them in the house in the wintertime. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so I think that's what And I bet the paper too. whites, too. The and paper- the paper whites, yeah. They okay. come in and they, like, they'll sit there, we'll open them, we'll sell them bulk, and they'll just start. They'll just be in full flower by the end of December. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, those are the ones that are yeah, blooming. It's such a fun gift too. Yeah. You know, um, to give somebody um, paper whites or amaryllis or whatever. It's you know, it's a gift that they'll enjoy for weeks and weeks and weeks. Mm-hmm. Yes. 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 Definitely. Um, Mike is asking. Uh, he's saying he just tuned in, so I don't know if you already answered this question, but how do you store your bulbs properly? Thank you. Um, well, if you get them. If you're like ordering them online, they're going to send them to you about the time that you need to put them in the ground. Okay. Um, if you get them early, say you bought them, you know, last weekend and you're not going to have time to plant them for a couple more weeks or another week or something, then I would just keep them in a cool, dark area. Maybe the garage, maybe a spare bedroom that you don't use that's cool. Um, and just leave them in the packing that they came in and um, they should be fine. Okay. Excellent. So just for those of you like Mike, who might be joining us here at the bottom of the hour here on RealityRadio101.com, uh, we are talking to Peggy Ann Montgomery uh, from the Garden Media uh, Group and FlowerBulbs.com. We're talking the buzz about bulbs. So we kind of think of our, our flower bulbs, especially like our tulips and our daffodils, our early spring color, as just kind of that spring color. So Peggy's joined us. We're talking about just kind of maintaining our bulbs, planting some tips and tricks, uh, but also knowing that you know they're great for our early spring pollinators, our bees and and other things. That's right. The perfect source of nectar. <laughs> yeah. Or pollen. Pollen. And I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. Absolutely. You know, it's really important in the early spring, um, you know, when those those first pollinators are out and and looking for that um, pollen and nectar, it's, um, it's really important that they're there. And one of the reasons, one of the many reasons that bee numbers are dwindling is because of loss of habitat. Mm. So by creating this, in your own space, um, it's really important. Boy, if everybody did a little bit, um, we could make a lot more habitat for wildlife and improve our environment as a whole. Yeah, I think so. And I think it's come a long way with people planting, um, you know, as a designer, yep. you know, people planting their summer perennials and shrubs for for the bees. And I think um, this season, the spring season, is getting a little overlooked a bit, you know. And so I mm-hmm. think this is a great idea to really concentrate on, like you said, the, the specific bulbs as well as making sure they're single bulbs so that the, the bees can access the pollen. That, that is really great that I think people can really look at their bulbs differently. You know, I do too. And I mean, uh, you know, they're so beautiful. I, I would never want to live without them anyway. But just knowing um, the good that they can be doing for the pollinators in our area just makes it even better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, certainly. Mm-hmm. So if you are just joining us and perhaps you have a question, um, perhaps you missed the first part of the show and still have a question, uh, you can write us here now in studio 101 at gmail.com. Again, in studio 101 at gmail.com. And speaking of which, Nan has written in uh, and Nan writes, someone told me that the bigger the bulb uh, is better. Bigger bulbs are better. And she's wondering if that's true. Um, yeah, that really can be the case, and it's interesting. 
um, if you are going to buy bulbs, you'll see a size generally written after it. It could be 8 to 10. It's usually in centimeters. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, bigger bulbs um, are, are better. They can, um, you know, they just have more gusto to produce better, more flowers. Um, so size does matter in this case. It really does. Um, you know, most people aren't going to be selling anything that's too small, that's not going to bloom, that you're not going to be successful with. Um, but size does matter. And um, there's also uh, another way they measure them, like um, with daffodils, they'll even call it the number of noses, the number of, like, bulbs and bulblets Ooh, on each bulb. Okay. Interesting. That's Interesting. good to know. And now... <clears throat> so, that, the, you know, the great size, that's different for every single bulb. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. And But then the little, because then there are yeah. little ones, like I'm thinking like the muscari and the snowdrops, those bulbs are going to be much smaller. Right. They're just so tiny. Yes. Um, but they they're still will give a size for them, but okay. they're never going to, you know, get huge. Right. Now, um, you know, tulip bulbs can be quite large. Um, let's see. Um, allium bulbs can be mm -hmm. really big for some of the giant alliums yeah. those bulbs can be quite large too mm -hmm. um so it you know it depends i i don't think it's something that um you know a regular home gardener should worry too much about i i don't think a reputable source would be selling anything that was too small to be effective right yeah no i think i agree because the sources are usually regardless of where you're buying them the source is you know usually it comes from holland right right so yeah most do yeah Oh, uh, so we've got another question. And this is a good one, too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so Paul writes in, hi, should we plant bulbs in groups? Uh, he's heard that it's better this way to plant them. Uh, but is that true? Uh, love the show and your guests. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. Yes, yes, Paul, please plant in big groups. Um, I think um, the flowers look better that way. Mm -hmm. If they're tall ones, they actually help each other stand up. Mm -hmm. It's much easier for pollinators to find a large group. Um, so but gone are the days of planting in a row like tin soldiers. <laughs> so, yeah, keep them in big groups and very natural looking. And um, you'll not only have a better show for yourself, but you'll have a better show for pollinators. Yes, yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's the designer in you coming out, Peggy Ann. And Matthew and I would agree. You know, we love the for visiting a client who's a first-time gardener and their tulips are up and they're all, like, you know, in a row, like soldiers. And they're like, I didn't know it was going to happen that way. And I'm like, yep. <laughs> you know, know, not what you don't just plant one in the hole, right? Like, even though the packaging sometimes will say, you know, how, how deep or it to plant it, but really you should be creating a bigger and wider hole and then planting several bulbs in that hole? Well, there's a couple of ways you can do it. You can certainly do that method, and that works fine. Okay. In fact, I think it works for smaller bulbs really good, it like snowdrops or um, the grape hyacinths, you know, because they're little, so you can put quite a few in that one hole and okay. then make another one, and then you have groups of them. Another thing some people do is um, put an auger on their drill, and they auger a hole. Yeah. I just Which, saw this, um, Peggy really? Ann. I just saw that on a Facebook group, and I want to get one <laughs> because I just peter oh, out. Yeah. Like, I start digging, and then, like, I'm, like, done. I don't know. <laughs> it takes the fun out of it. It does. And I saw this <laughs> auger thing, and I thought I could plant a lot of bulbs with a <laughs> drill. Seriously. Oh, I just picture you going from zero to a thousand. Expensive. You just go to your home store, whichever one that is, and buy one. They're just a few dollars. And especially if you're going to be planting very many, it is so wonderful um, <laughs> because you make that hole nice and deep. And, you know, for the bulbs, it just really makes things um, so much easier and uh, makes it an absolute joy. I have parts of my garden where the soil is really compacted and hard. And if I had to hand dig all those, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, so, yeah. you, so it's just like a, an auger that you would see on, I don't know, an auger, but you're attaching it to your drill. And so then mm -hmm. you're just going into the ground, everyone that, you know, I know they can't, I always forget when I use my hands, I always forget people can't see me. Right, Gary? Uh, <laughs> so, so it is radio, but uh, Google it. I think, uh, I think uh, I'm, oh, I, this, uh, Sean has written in, says he uses a paint mix, mixture to auger. Oh. Yeah. That would be great. Okay. 
I think. Excellent. Autocorrect. Yeah. It yeah, works great. It really great. does help. Um, if you have a lot to do, um, and, you know, for the few dollars that the auger costs, it's like totally worth it. It will make it a snap and make you want to plant more next year or next fall yeah. or next spring. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That I'm so excited about that. <laughs> I have to say. So yeah, so some the, when I saw it everybody said oh, too on the Facebook group somebody says everybody said, "Where would you get that?" and of course Amazon carries them. Um, but Lee Valley, oh, they you know, do, and I'm yeah. Yeah. You can buy them anywhere. You can buy them <laughs> anywhere, for sure. But uh, yeah. I think that's a yeah. great great idea. So um, so I'm looking forward to doing that. <laughs> uh, I'll I report know. back. It really is fun. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm glad you mentioned that too because uh, honestly, even though in the industry I've never seen it before, I did not know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was this um, huge aha. You know, I hadn't seen it before either. I think my husband showed me the first time. He works at Santa Clear Gardens in um, Wayne, Pennsylvania, and he puts in thousands of bulbs every year. Oh. And um, he's the one that taught me how to do it. And I'll tell you what, it is the it's the bomb. It's the only way to go. Oh wow. Yes, and I bet, yeah, any commercial or, or or public gardens, right, that they have to do something yep. like that. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, excellent. <laughs> and excellent. that way, too, it's kind of nicer because you can get um, a more, like, you know, scattered look. So they aren't all in a row, mm-hmm. um, you know, which is nice. And another method that some people use, uh, you know, like especially maybe in grass or other areas, is that they just gently throw out a handful of bulbs and plant them where they land. Mm. Yep. That's interesting. You yeah. know, and that way to get like a, you know, a really natural look. That'd be fun with kids, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That would. And, you know, ball planting with kids is perfect because, um, you know, the, you know, getting out at this time of the year and doing that, that's fun for kids. They're outside. And then in the spring when they see what they've done and how they're coming up and how fast they come up. Um, they will be amazed and so proud of themselves when they see their hard work, you know, in the springtime. Yeah, that would be great. I know I did that when my kids were in sc- school. They We planted bulbs in the fall, you know, in kindergarten, mm-hmm. you know, they plant the bulbs. And then in, the, in, in grade one, then, you know, the next year they would see them bloom, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, you know, it it, uh, it really is. It I think bulbs are a great thing. And we often talk about that, even uh, amaryllis bulbs, which I know are more of an indoor bulb here. Um, but they're also a great thing for children because of the way, you know, how quickly, once they get going, right? I think it's great every morning yeah. the kids wake up and it's grown a little bit more and it's grown a little bit more. And I, I just think they're, they're such a great way to inspire kids uh, to get into gardening. So I think outdoor bulbs just as much. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm totally with you on the amaryllis. I love amaryllis. I always have them. And um, I give a lot of them away for gifts at Christmas time because mm-hmm. they're so awesome. But you're right for kids that it's amazing. They still grow and you know an inch or more a day, so it's they can really see it. Um, but you know, getting the kids outside on a nice fall day with fresh air and uh, hot apple cider, um, <laughs> you know, that's the stuff memories are made of. That's right. That's right. It isn't all about picking pumpkins and apples, right? It should be. We should also <laughs> have weekends where we plant bulbs. We have to start right, a new right. trend. We have to start <laughs> a new trend. So that's great. So I just wanted to. This is uh, Peggy Ann. This is Gary, the producer. I just brought into the studio. I showed uh, Joanne and Matthew. I have a paint stirrer that I use to stir paint. And that is also used as a garden auger. It works great. If you want to dig that hole down there, some people cut it up a little bit to make it sharper, you know, but you don't have to. And those are readily available, Mm -hmm. and they're just like 4 or $5. But if you put that in a drill... It makes a perfect hole for bulbs, and right down the ground, it's it's great. Yeah. So I just wanted to show you that. That's yeah, all. Yeah, no, oh, that's great. Cool. That's great. We'll post a picture. Maybe we'll post a picture sure. of that. Thank you, Gary. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like it's just Boy, transformed it sure me. Yeah, I, I, yeah, my because usually I kind of have to confess I dread because I do peter out my attention span. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, also, I think most of it is because my garden is so full. So like you yeah. know, I try to dig a hole here. Oh, hit a root. Oh, you know, here, yeah. can't, like, so I think that's my challenge, it, you know, compared to, let's say, a new gardener, really finding yeah. the spots for them is a little bit more challenging for me. So I do tend to kind of peter out. Hence the two bags of allium from last year that are still in my garage because I never got around to planting <laughs> them. <laughs> You're probably not the only one. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, but I, I see how that happens. I mean, 
it happens here. We, you know, you go outside and you've got your bag of bulbs. We, we call it taking your plants for a walk. And we <laughs> walk around and around and around the garden until we find an inch where we can stick them in. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Um, so Phil has uh, joined us as well, and he has a question. Um, and he's and so overall, how long do the bulbs take to grow? Can I expect flowers in March or earlier or later? Okay, well, that's a good question, mm-hmm. and it kind of depends on the bulb because some flower very early spring, as early as February. Um, some are mid-season, you know, flowering, so they would maybe, you know, bloom in May, April or May, depending on where you are. And some are quite late, and some even flower in the summertime. Mm-hmm. So you would have to, it would kind of depend on which kind of bulb, and um, you can always find out, um, you know, there'll be lists and things for early bloomers, mid-season bloomers, and late bloomers. That's right. And we do, and it's exciting, Phil, that there are some that will bloom in March or earlier in February, and those are the ones that are perfect for pollinators because that's really, you know, February, March, you know, the earlier the better mm-hmm. when it comes to the hungry, hungry in- beneficial insects, correct? Absolutely. Yeah, it's just perfect. And then, You know, another thing to suggest is that when you're looking at bulbs to try to get a group from each one of these categories from Mm. early, mid, late, and summer, um, then you know you've got that pollinator food for several months, Um, not to mention having a continuous um, supply of flowers. That's something um, homeowners sometimes struggle with is getting color for all season. Mm -hmm. Yes, especially starting that early. And is it true that the the bees will keep returning? So if they came to this cluster of flowers today, then they come, the same bees kind of remember and come back to them tomorrow. You know, I believe that is true. And um, there's also research, I'm not an entomologist, but there's also research that um, bees tell other bees and give directions. Ah, that's cool. That is um, cool. They do a waggle dance, it's called, I think, and they kind of describe where it was. And so they, they would indeed send other, um, send other bees back to that area to feed. Okay. That's good to know. And if you make your garden more pollinator friendly, you know, you're going to have, um, you know, a lot of those like solitary bees and other things, bumblebees in the yard, which are not, um, solitary bees don't have hives, so they are not aggressive. They don't have anything to protect. Mm -hmm. Um, Same with bumblebees. Um, They're great to have in the garden. Personally, I am allergic to, like, bee and wasp stings, and I I carry an EpiPen. And, you know, my yard is a pollinator paradise, and I've never been stung. It's Mm -hmm. the last thing they want to do. Yes. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. For sure. And yes, Some people are afraid of bees, and Mm -hmm. I understand that, but um, generally bees are not aggressive. Um, Wasps can get a little aggressive um, late in the summer, but the early solitary bees and the queens and the bumblebees are absolutely no threat. Yeah. Um, so just kind of like what Phil was saying, um, she, he was saying about how long does it take the bulbs to bloom, but I'm just wondering, some of the ones that we buy commercially, like the tulips and the daffodils, how long does it take for them to rebuild next year's flower? Will they always bloom year after year? A lot of people tend to dig them up and throw them out or have very little luck at having them restart again. Okay, that's a good question. Some bulbs will, they call it naturalized. And that was going to be my next one. Bulbs. Okay. Um, so things like snowdrops and um, grape hyacinths and, you know, um, crocus for that matter and winter buttercups, these are all flowers that naturally and easily um, reproduce. And so every year your area of them is going to get bigger and bigger. And they can last forever. Um, right. They can last a really long time. I've noticed that sometimes with my large alliums, you know, with the, um, you know, the really big ones, the summer bloomers, that every, you know, they fade a, a little bit. Like every year, there's a few less and a few less. Mm-hmm. And maybe after five years, I plant some more. It's still worth it to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but most of the things that we've talked about are all things that will naturalize and grow back again and again. And so after the flower, um, after it flowers, you have to leave that foliage alone. Mm-hmm. It's going to take a little bit of time for that to kind of die back. 
And what that's doing is that's nourishing the bulb. Okay. So you got to let that happen. And then the bulb builds up its stores, you know, for the rest of the year. And so it can flower for you again next year. If you pulled up a bulb that was in flower, you'd see that it was almost flat. There's nothing left in it. It's given all its food to the flower. Ah, okay. That's good. And that's a good reason to plant the, the bulbs within your garden so that the, because the full, you know, that is a challenge, right? The yellowing mm. leaves of the tulips and, and some of the yep. other bulbs, you know, it isn't attractive necessarily. So, you know, it's nice to kind of think about that when you're planting, which is why I also love that auger, you know, so you can kind of get into your garden <clears throat> a little right. bit more. And then the shrubs, you know, that's the peonies and, and the later, a little bit slightly later blooming uh, uh, things in your garden will kind of disguise or take away from the foliage that you just need to leave up, right? Exactly. And, you know, part of that is just kind of accepting you know how nature works nobody's pretty all the time mm -hmm. and um you know yeah. so we have to accept a little bit of that but planting under shrubs that are later going to leap out are some tricks and um another trick i really like is um planting the bulbs like tulips or daffodils in among daylilies mm -hmm. because as the tulip and daffodil foliage fades the day foliage comes out and covers it up oh that's a good tip that is a good For tip sure. Yes, definitely. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. And I'm even thinking my poppies because the one thing, you know, poppies look amazing when they bloom, but the foliage initially, I know my kids, I remember coming home one day and the kids were, um, my my two young boys were in the, my garden with the, the dandelion, you know, the thing that tries to remove the dandelions, but it was my, pop, yeah. my poppy plant because they felt like the, <laughs> the, the early blooms of the, the foliage of a poppy looked very much like a dandelion. And I'll never forget. Uh -huh. I don't think I ever got out of the car that fast, man. Oh. <laughs> so well, at least they were helping. Yes, it was. Yeah, they pay, they were paying attention, weren't they? But yeah, I could see you know kind of prolonging that by adding some some bulbs in that spot. So they, I've got a new spot to put my auger. There we go. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Almost always a spot. And uh, one thing I uh, want your um, listeners to think about is going to flowerbulbs.com. They've they're not going to sell you anything there. They're just there to inspire you. And you will see, like, um, combinations you can put together, um, different color combinations, how to do the lasagna planting we talked about. Excellent. And all kinds of other things and beautiful, beautiful photography. And we try to show that photography, too, on all the social media channels. Um, but there's some fun things there. And some great recipes to put together some um, combinations with. Wonderful. And I was on that site, yeah, on the weekend and today as well. And it Same. is, yeah, it is a great site. What a beautiful, it's beautiful yeah. and just packed, filled with information. Super easy to navigate. Definitely check it out. Yeah. So this has been lots of great oh, information. You. So we can we leave you with one other? Well, I'm sure we might have another question, but I want to ask you one last question, Peggy Ann. Okay. So aside from pollinators, you know, we everybody knows about tulips and daffodils. Is there, um, let's say, a lesser known or more unusual bulb um, that you'd like us to order from flowers.com? Or no, I know we can't buy it from the flowers.com, but uh, from the yeah. bulb suppliers. Oh, gosh, that's such a hard one because I love so many. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, I just, I, um, I love Allium for the summertime. Um, Crocosme is great in the summertime. Mm -hmm. um, you know, checkered lily might be one that not a lot of people know about. It's oh, called okay. Fritillaria milagris, and it looks like the flower is kind of pendulous. It's hanging upside down. And it looks like it's purple and white checkered. Oh, okay. Excellent. Um, they are very precious. We have quite a few. And some are white and checkered, but the normal ones are purple and white. And um, it's not one that everybody grows, but it is the cutest thing you ever saw. It is, you'll, you know, it'll make you stop in your tracks. Oh, perfect. So give us that name again. It's called Checkered Lily. Okay, excellent. And the botanic name, um, I'll just spell it for you. It's Fritillaria, F-R-I-T-I-L-L-A-R-I-A. -L -L -A -A. Okay. 
nice. Very nice. Well, thank you. I think that's, you know, because I think sometimes it's nice to have something unusual. Yes. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> and, you know, remember, you know, gardening is really just all about experimenting. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you, everybody listening, just go be free and do whatever makes you happy. There's there's not one right and one wrong mm. about gardening. As long as you love it, it's perfect. Oh, thank you. That's 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 so true. Very much true. Very much so. Um, just as we end here, Peggy Ann, uh, Susan writes in, Hi, Joanne and Matthew. Big fan of yours. Love the show tonight. What fantastic tips and tricks. Uh, please keep up the fantastic work, Susan. So thank oh, you very thank much. Thank you, Susan. I'm so oh, glad. that's very sweet, Susan. Yeah, I'm so. This and has been such a perfect topic. I just gonna say, yeah, Peggy Ann, we thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for all well, the tips and tricks. Thank you so much. This is a really wonderful opportunity to teach um, other people about, um, you know, a class of plants that I absolutely love and adore. This has been so much fun. Excellent. And we do want to give a shout out to your website. So that's www.flowerbulbs.com. Um, is there any yep. other any other ways that our listeners can follow? Oh, yeah. Please um, follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Um, We do giveaways from time to time. We're always trying to put up inspiring pictures to let people know and, and, you know, what's blooming and, you know, what's coming up and what they should be looking for um, just to get people inspired. Um, And this year, the favorite seems to be on all social media is a um, grape hyacinth that's pink. There's a new pink one finally on the market. Ooh. Nice. That sounds I know. Good. Everybody likes that one the most. They <laughs> are gorgeous. Oh, excellent. And on the social media that you, you were just mentioning, is it just flowerbulbs.com for all of them? Yep. Yep. You'll find us there. Okay. And I know on Instagram it's flowerbulbs and it's spelled D-O-T-C-O-M. Perfect. Yes, you're right. Thank you. No problem. No problem. And then you have uh, listed as well uh, for Pinterest, for those of our Pinterest lovers, um, flower Uh bulbs make you bloom. So that's uh, that's perfect as well. Yeah, that's new. And then um, we're trying to focus um, a little more on Instagram this year. So it's super fun. And um, we're working with some um, influencers and, and things like that and are trying to show some fun things and how-to videos and that sort of thing. Wonderful. Well, that's great. So our listeners can check out uh, Flower Bulbs, D-O-T-C-O-M, so uh, on right. Instagram so that we can get some more. And I'm sure you'll have some recipes and, and like you said, the container planting. That Those are great ideas for, for new gardeners. Right. And, of course, people can write to me on those sites, too, if they have a question. Um, they can write it to me, and I'll be the one that's answering it. Oh, Wonderful. That's amazing. Yes. Well, thank you again, okay. Peggy Ann. Um, we really enjoyed the show. Um, and to all our listeners and you, again, we're going to post it as a podcast so you can uh, follow it in again. That's right. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Okay. Thanks we'll talk again. Week. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. Wow, what a great show and obviously a popular topic. We never know because, you know, we, we know how to plant bulbs and we just assume everybody knows how to plant bulbs. But really, it, 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 uh, there is a lot to it. And, yes. and the labels and the instructions on the packaging, you know, don't tend to be very elaborate. Exactly. So it is good to have something to reference. So thank you for all those questions. Pointy side up, water it a little bit, store it and keep it cool. Yep. Oh, and oh. Bob just says, as we ending, uh, thank you, Bob. He writes in, says, fantastic show. Uh, and as we end, yes, Yaz, John, Josh, Julie, Mason, Mike, Nan, Paul, Phil, Sean, and Susan. And I think those are all actually coincidentally written uh, in alphabetical order, including oh. just mentioning Bob off the top. So there you go. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for writing in your questions. As always, we love to hear from you in studio 101 at gmail.com. Um, thank you, Gary, for helping us produce the show. Thanks, Joanne, for another fantastic week. You're welcome. Always Great enjoy week. doing this with yeah. you. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in uh, to Down the Garden Path here on Reality Radio 101. Goodbye, everybody. Night. Thank you for listening to Down the Garden Path with your hosts, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing, right here on Reality Radio. 101.